My name is Dan Libby. If you are new here, I'm, I'm one of the assistant pastors. We actually have four here. Uh, pastor Chuck, our family pastor, Pastor Joel is our youth pastor, and then Pastor Hamish is our child pastor. I am the missions pastor, uh, discipleship pastor, a um, little bit of this, a little bit of that, but honestly, I just really want to welcome you uh, to our services today, and I hope that you came prepared uh, for God to bless you. Let's start off with a little bit of an exercise. I want you to turn to your neighbor. I want you to tell them that the Lord reigneth. Go ahead, turn to your neighbor. Good. Now turn to the other one that you chose not to turn to before and say, the Lord reigneth. All right, that's good, good. We're letting light up. Now I want to do something even more fun, okay? I'm going to ask all of the men, when I say the Lord Almighty, I want you to say, he reigns, okay? You ready? Just let's practice. Say, he reigns. He reigns. Louder than that, he reigns. he reigns. All right, the Lord Almighty. Hallelujah. Okay, ladies, I want you to say it same thing. He reigns. Come on now. Come on now. One more time. He reigns. Okay, that's good. The Lord Almighty. All right, that's good. Praise the Lord. Now I want you to ask yourself individually this one question. Does the Lord Almighty reign? Ask yourself. Does the Lord Almighty reign in my life? Does the Lord Almighty reign over my heart? Does the Lord Almighty reign over my life? Am I showing that in my actions? That's a good question, I think, for all of us to answer. Do you believe that? The psalm is what's known as an enthronement psalm, where the psalmist writes and he declares God to be exactly who he is, the king over all creation. The Lord over all, Jehovah, Yahweh, the one who is all-powerful, all-existent, the King, Lord over creation. This is who the psalmist is writing about, and this is his intent, to show who God really is to those that are going to be singing this psalm and those that will be reading it in ages to come. Who is this Lord? The Lord reigns. This is a, a psalm that the ancient Israelites would have needed to hear. You see, because at one point in time, after God had given them the commandments to just be holy, uh, obey the Sabbath, you know, recognize the Sabbath, let the land rest. They did this for decades and even centuries even. And at the end result, God had been sending prophets to them to warn them and tell them, hey, you need to repent. You need to start obeying my Sabbath and, and recognizing these things. But they weren't doing it. And as a result, God raised up the Babylonians that came and they took them captive and they led them into their land and, and the land got its rest for 70 years. They were enslaved. Jerusalem had been destroyed, burned to the ground. It is nothing but rubble. The temple, this glorious temple that Solomon built for the Lord that was ordained in gold, that was just meant to point people to Jesus and point people to the Lord had been destroyed. It's nothing but rubble. And after 70 years, after God had allowed the land to rest and the Sabbaths were obeyed, he allowed the nation of Israel to return back to Jerusalem. And they started rebuilding the walls. Under Nehemiah and Ezra, they rebuilt the temple, although it wasn't as glorious as it was in Solomon's day. When he built it, they brought it back up, and there was now time for them to start going into the temple. And it's at this time where they would have sung these songs, this psalm itself, the Lord reigns. This is something that the Israelites needed to be reminded of. That amidst all of the turmoil, amidst the, the fact that this world, that the world that they were living in, seemingly out of control by conquerors, seemingly out of control by wicked men, that God restores and that God is on the throne and he reigns. And listen, let me ask you this question today. 
Because I think this applies to us as well. Doesn't it seem to you like this world is a little out of control? I mean, oh my goodness. You don't have to look very far. You really don't have to look very far to see the chaos. You don't have to look very far to see the wars. I mean, how many in here, when they saw Iran bombing Israel, got nervous? Right? Rightly so. I mean, wars cause that stuff. It's chaos. What about division? Have you ever seen a time in... Maybe some of you older people that that have been around in America long enough, have you ever seen a time when our nation was more divided? I'm 44. I remember pre-9-11. I remember right post-9-11 where we were were together. We were united. But really, this, this world is in chaos. There's lies. There's an attack on truth. You see it every day. Social media is, is pushing it. Your, your, your TV is pushing it. We need to be reminded of the same truth today. Paul, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy about what he called perilous times. And I believe that we're living in those perilous times even today. I'll read to you a little bit of what he says. He says, this know also that in the last days. Can I tell you, how many of you agree that we're in the last days? We are in the last days, not just because of what's happening around us, but because we're in the church age. And this is the last days. This is the last days that God has given man to repent and to turn to him. We are in these last days. Right? He says, so in the last days, he says, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Wow. Wow. A little bit of eye-opener here. Have you ever seen a generation that has been more about me than the one we're living in right now? Take your phone out. Take a selfie, right? Men shall be lovers of them own selves, he says. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Don't get me started on that. I mean, parents, you know. You know where, where I'm talking about. Unthankful. Unholy, without natural affection. Without natural affection. Now, I don't have to go very far just to look at the... Listen, I'll, I'll tread, tread very lightly here, but... The way that we abort babies seems as if there's no love. This natural affection. We are in the last days in these perilous times. He says, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. We're in the last times. Traitors, heavy, uh, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Are we in those days right now, church? We are in those days. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, Paul instructs Timothy and the church and to us today, from such turn away. So we're living in those last days, and I think it's very important that we remind ourselves who we are, where we are, and who is rightly on the throne, ruling over everything in this creation. This is God. I said earlier that it, it seems like everything's out of control, but I love the phrase, things aren't always as they seem. Amen? I love it because it may seem like this world's out of control, but there's a sovereign God in heaven who is over it all and is controlling, not out of control, as some may seem. He is in control over it all. The Lord reigns. The first three words, the Lord reigneth. I love how the KJV puts it, reigneth. Now, for you English teachers, uh, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about here. That, that little uh, suffix, I guess is what you would call it. I'm not an English major. But uh, eth, E-T-H, reigneth. Uh, that is the third person singular present indicative of verbs. I had to Google that. I had no idea what that means. And it took me like five minutes of just thinking about what in the world is that talking about? And so I had to put it in, like, redneck terms. That's all I understand. I mean, I failed English. Like, I failed English, right? So, and I think I'm failing English even today. But 
That's just a redneck, fancy way, a redneck way to say it's happening, right? Today, we just put an S on the ends of it. He reigns, right? Back then, they put an F. But I love how he puts it because it's almost poetic. It's happening. It's real. It's actual. This is perpetual. He is on the throne, and he's there forevermore, reigning over anything that you ever have to have in your life that troubles you. He knows. He understands. He cares, and he's on the throne. So, whatever season of uncertainty that you're facing, like the ancient Israelites were facing back then, whatever financial problems that you're facing, whatever times in your life where it seems maybe even your physical condition uh, is uncertain, maybe it's a job, you don't know, maybe it's the political unrest all over the world, the chaos that's happening, can I tell you that God is over it all, and he has a plan, and he's working it out for your good and for his glory, amen, so as I try to get into this, and I want to really show you who the Lord is, I have three ways that I'm going to show you how God reigns over this world today. First of all, God reigns gloriously. Look with me in verse number one. It says, the Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with, clothed with strength wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. Listen, God is majestic. We see his majesty here in this verse. He says he is clothed with majesty. And when the Bible talks about majesty, it uses this, this old ancient Hebrew word. I'll just spell it out for you because I'm American redneck and it's hard for me to say it. G-E-U-T. It's like geot, right? Geot. And when it speaks of that, it speaks of a rising up of something that is illustrious, Right, and, and so just not long ago uh, in July, my wife and I took a trip to Colorado. We went out west, awesome trip. We, we went in, uh, you know how you're a flatlander for a while? You see a hill and you're like, wow, that's big, right? So you're like going through like Texas and it's nothing but like flat. And you're like, oh, look, there's a little hill over there. It's starting to get like big. And then and you're like, oh, look, it's a butte. Like, you know, one of those buttes that come up and do this. I was like, oh, it's a beaut. And then they start getting bigger. And you start looking at all these wonderful land formations that start rising up out of the ground. And, and so we, we make it through uh, Texas, and we get into New Mexico, you know, Arizona, and we head up to the Grand Canyon. We look at the Grand Canyon, we're like, oh, wow. You know, it like takes your breath away, right? It's huge. It almost looks like a picture, like unreal, right? Well, then we left there, and we went to Colorado. And as we're traveling north or northeast from uh, the Grand Canyon, we go through like the four corners, and it's just the painted desert, you know, it's just beautiful, but it's all sand and stuff. But then all of a sudden, off in the distance, you start seeing these things rising up. It's like, is that a mountain? And they're huge. They're huge. And I'm, we're getting to uh, uh, Bayfield, Colorado. We stayed there for a little while. And my wife and I, we were staying at this Airbnb, and... Uh, I asked the Airbnb host, I said, what's a good place to go just to kind of see some stuff? He says, just go up here. It's called the Mountain Road. He says, take that mountain road. It's going to zigzag and switch back all the way up the mountain. He says, you're going to get up there to the mountain. You're going to see some aspen trees. Keep going. He says, just keep on going. So that one day, we, I took my wife up there. And I'm going to tell you what, the Grand Canyon had nothing on it. Because I got up there, and I realized what the writer of the song, America the Beautiful, was talking about. When he said, purple mountains, majesty. It's like these mountains just rose up out of the ground. Majestic. I mean, huge. You want to talk about take your breath away? I sat there at sundown for an hour and waited for that sun just to go down behind there. Majesty. The writer of this psalm says, God is clothed in majesty. He puts this on. He puts this on. Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 3, they might have it on the screen for you. 
saw the Lord. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, majesty, and his train filled the temple, majesty. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings, and with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, The whole earth is full of his glory. The Lord reigns gloriously. Listen, he is a majestic being. If you ever got your eyes on the Lord, if you ever were able to see the Lord where he was at, you would say, majesty, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Isaiah got to see it. He is clothed in majesty. Now look with me again. He says the Lord is clothed with strength. Do you know God doesn't need anybody to clothe him with strength? God is not dependent on you, me, this creation at all to clothe him with strength. You know who he relies on for his clothing? Himself. You want to talk about power. You want to talk about somebody that doesn't need anything. He is the self-existent God. He is clothed with strength. He strengthens himself. His strength literally set this world in place. And I'm thinking about all those mountains that that God created. When I was there, listen, there was nothing I could do, even at the Grand Canyon, nothing I could do but then to think about God, to think about everything that he did, to think about all the works of creation. I could see God in everything. You know what Psalm 65 says? It says, which by his strength setteth fast the mountains, being girded with power. Oh, that psalmist knew that there was a God in heaven that created everything that you see here. And those mountains that seem unmovable to us, and they are unmovable to us, God set them in their place with his own strength. He is girded with strength. Amen. So he's girded with strength. Here we see his strength. We see his eternality as well. He says, thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. You know, God is the first and the last. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. And that means that no other person, no other thing created in this world could ever come against God. Nothing could ever dominate God. He is from old. Listen, this church uh, in Smyrna, in the book of Revelation, Rome had taken control over this huge empire. And because Rome was doing so good, they they thought it was Caesar's uh, doing. And so they made a decree and they said that all Roman citizens within the empire would have to come to uh, the temple where they would worship Caesar. They would say, Caesar is Lord. And you can imagine the Christians that were living at that time would have a problem with them saying, Caesar is Lord. And so Jesus writes to uh, this church at Smyrna. And he says, I am the first and the last. I which was dead and is alive. This church at Smyrna would have needed to know that Jesus reigned, that he was the first and that he was the last. And no matter what they faced, the persecutions that would have arise because of them not saying Caesar is Lord, they had a hope in a God who reigns, who was dead and is alive. There's a hope in Jesus. Amen. That's our call today. Our call today is to be enthralled with Jesus. Be enthralled with the Lord. To be enthralled means to be captivated by the fascination of a particular thing or a person. The psalmist I know must have caught a glimpse of God in heaven when he wrote this. Having the Lord in a proper perspective puts the rest of this world into its proper perspective. When you see God for who he really is, when you are enthralled with who he is, when you see his majesty, When you see his strength, 
When you see that he's eternal, there's nothing you can do but praise him for who he is and keep pressing on no matter what chaos this world throws at you. Jesus reigns glorious. Secondly, he reigns victoriously. Look at verse number three and four. It says, the floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up, lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. This psalmist here cries out to God. He says, the floods have lifted up. Many times in the Bible, the word floods talks about and speaks about and signifies the, the attacks from wicked men on God's plans and purposes. And a lot of times it talks about uh, the attacks of men against God's people. David understood what the floods of men were. This psalmist would have understood what the floods of men were talking about. He also says that the floods have lifted up their voice. Can I tell you that sometimes in this world, this chaos can drown our thoughts out. It can drown our minds and, and get us uh, focused on some, something other than what God wants us to focus on. It can take our eyes off of God who reigns above everything in life. It can get our eyes focused on things of this world. You know what the old hymn says, turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of this world will grow strangely dim. We're to be looking at Jesus. When uh, it says also here that the, uh, the floods have lifted up, O oh Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice, the floods lift up their waves. I don't know if you've ever been down to uh, the Pensacola Beach. You probably have if you've been here long enough. Um, if you haven't, I feel sorry for you. It's a very nice place. My daughter and I would just go down there, and we would have this game that we played. We would see who could stand in the surf the longest without falling over. And it doesn't matter how little the waves are. Like, you cannot sit very long with your feet planted just like this before either falling backwards or falling forwards. Because those waves come and they crash at your feet, and what do they do? They take out all the sand from underneath your feet, right? I mean, you just flow out, and you just fall. And usually, I'm the one that falls first. I'm taller and heavier than she is, and so I fall first, right? Can I tell you that God stands amidst the flood like that song talks about that we sang just a little while ago. He shall not be moved no matter what this world throws at us. This world cannot bring our God down. He is a God that reigns over everything. And in verse number two, uh, uh, four, he says, uh, the Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty wa waves of the sea. This psalmist said, Seeing God step in, and he had turned and said, the Lord on high is mightier. I think about the disciples as they're traveling across the Sea of Galilee, and they look and they see this person coming. They're like, who is that? Look like a ghost, and it's Jesus, the Lord of all creation, walking on top of this waves, this boisterous waves. I think about how powerful God must have been just to be able to do that. He reigns in power, and the psalmist sees that. He says that he is mightier. Listen, God never gasses out. I spent a lot of time in the gym this past year. Obviously, not in a little bit, but I had spent some time in the gym, and I tried to see if I could just pump up with as much weight as I possibly could so I can seem bigger than I actually was, right? And uh, a lot of, I'm not good at benching, by the way. Like, I am the worst. I think my form might be wrong. I don't know. But, like, I can only do, like, 135 pounds. It's not much. But I'll get like three reps in, and you know what, I, what happens to me? I gas out. Like, I have nothing. And I better hope somebody's there to pull that, that barbell up because I'm going to choke myself. But you know what? God never gasses out. God never runs out of strength. He is omnipotent. He has all the strength in the world. The psalmist saw that, that he rises above the noise of many waters. No matter what this world is doing, friend, let me tell you, no matter how hard this, this world tries to get your mind off of God, he reigns above it all. He is louder. His voice is louder than the crashing waves. I don't know if you've ever been along the seashore and you've heard a big wave crash against the rocks. 
I grew up in New England. I know what that sounds like. I'm talking cliffs. And these big waves would come and go, woof. You could feel it. Our God is mightier than those waves. He can stand in that crashing wave and stand still because he's powerful. I think about those disciples that were on the boat with Jesus and they're going, they're going across this sea and man, the waves are just crashing. Jesus is where? He's in the back of the boat sleeping on a pillow, right? And they go to him and they say, Master, what? We perish. And he said, really, guys? Come on. Do you not see who, who's in the boat with you right now? Do you not believe in who I am? Do you not believe that the, the ways my plans for you are higher than what this world has for you? That I am forever you know what he says to the waves? Peace be still. Oof. I don't even think he had to shout that. The Lord is mightier than the waves. He told those waves, peace be still. You know what he says to us? Be still and know. Be still and know that I am God. That's our call. Hey, I, I, know the, I know what you're going through. I'm the master of the sea. I have a purpose for you. I have a plan for you. You're on my mind. You will never not be on my mind. I understand where you are. Jesus was a savior that was acquainted with our griefs. He hung on a cross and he did it. And he endured the sufferings of the cross so that you could experience joy with him in heaven. He's a savior we can trust. He's a savior we can count on. Jesus, our Lord, reigns victoriously. That's our king. Thirdly, I want you to see that he reigns righteously. He reigns righteously. Look at verse number five. Thy testimonies are very sure, he says. And when he speaks about testimonies, this is a poetic way of the Bible saying God's word or God's promises. There was a, a preacher by the name of R.T. Kendall. He's still alive. He's about 89 years old now, 90 years old. Um, preached and was in ministry for 70 years. Uh, and actually, Jack Light sent me this uh, video this week. came at the right time because I was trying to figure out like what, a, what kind of application point could I make here. Well, Jack had sent me this Facebook uh, reel, uh, and it's an interview that uh, a man had with this R.T. Kendall man. And after uh, 70 years in ministry, this interviewer asked R.T. Kendall, he says, what would you say to a young R.T. Kendall? Now, and he didn't say, oh, you need to spend more time in seminary. He didn't say you need to spend more time going to church. He said these two things, read your Bible, know your Bible, and pray. Know your Bible, and pray a lot. Those are two words after 70 years of ministry that a man told what he would say to his younger self. Know your Bible, and pray a lot. Our Bible's trustworthy. How trustworthy is our Bible? I say one in 100 trillion. One in 100 trillion. Some of you may have heard of this before, but uh, there was a man uh, by the name of Peter Stoner. He was a, a statistician at uh, MIT. And so he would run these tests or these, uh, these ways to try to figure out statistics. And, and so found out that the Bible has about 25% of it is uh, Bible prophecy, right? There's over 300 prophecies that speak of Jesus' birth, his death, his resurrection, and the end times, right? There's 60 real major ones that have, have been uh, prophesied of. 
And so this statistician went about to see just the probabilities of eight of those prophecies coming to pass. Just eight of them. He said it's one in 100 trillion. To give you an idea of this, you would take the state of Texas, which is arguably one of the biggest states in our country, you would fill the state of Texas with silver dollars, two feet thick. And you say, I would take one silver dollar, and I would go and I would mark that silver dollar. And I would go, without you looking, I would go somewhere in Texas and drop that thing down in that pile of coins, silver dollars. And the likelihood of eight, just eight prophecies coming to pass, the way they did, would be just like you walking somewhere blindfolded into Texas, reaching down and picking up that one that I marked. That's just eight prophecies fulfilled. There's over 300 that Jesus fulfilled. Our Bible, our word is, te- is tried. It is tested. It is trustworthy. It is what the Bible calls very sure. We can trust it. We can rely on it. So what do you do? You claim a promise from his word. Hey, you want, you want an awesome promise from his word? Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. Oh, that's that's a wonderful promise for us as Christians today, isn't it? Why? Because, hey, listen, God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. How many promises do you hold true to God? Do you pray God's promises? You should pray God's promises. God, I, I, I need you. He says, I'll never leave you. His word is trustworthy. For the child of God, there's security in that. And for the sinner, that's a warning. You say, why? Because even here in this next passage, this next section of our passage, we see God is holy. He says, Thy testimonies are very sure. Verse 5. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. God is holy. Habakkuk speaks of it. He says that thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. God can't even look on your sin. Holiness, he says, becometh thine house. Literally, that means that holiness adorns God's house. And you know, we are his holy house. They're going to have 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 on the screen. It says, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And then 1 Peter 2.9 says something uh, extremely powerful. It says, but ye, the church, ye church, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a what? A holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. God is serious about holiness. So what do we need to do? Be loyal to the throne. That's what you need to do in this life as a Christian. Be loyal to the throne. Concern yourself with holiness. God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. And I don't know how serious you take that. But let me just nail it down. God says, be ye holy. For I'm holy. That's serious. That there's a God in heaven that's holy. And he can't look on sin. Sometimes I think that we live our lives flippantly. Like we don't care about God's holiness. And that God will never hold us accountable for our sin. Oh, God's a gracious God. He'll he'll lovingly forgive me. Oh, no. Listen, he will. But he wants you to be holy. He doesn't want you to live sinfully. We need to understand that. Our God is of purer eyes. He cannot behold your sin. Do you see the gravity in that? Do you see the Lord that's high and lifted up? 
sitting in his throne, reigning over all of creation, and think to yourself, it's okay. It's not okay. Don't be comfortable with your sin. We all fall short. We all fall short of God's glory in this life. We are sinners. Don't be comfortable there. Our God is a holy God. Listen, if you're a child of God today, you have the Savior. You have the one that you can run to. You have the forgiveness of sin. You have a relationship with the one that loved you and died for you. But listen, every time you sin, it hurts him. When he was on the cross, he was bleeding for every sin that you ever committed prior to Christ and after him. Get serious about his holiness. Concern yourself with his holiness. For the unbeliever out here, concern yourself with his holiness. Do you see the gravity of your sin? Your sins have separated you from him. He can't even look at it. One day, you'll pass away. One day, you will die. And although you might not see God reigning in this world today, and although God may not be reigning over your heart today, he's reigning in heaven. And when you pass from this, this life to the next, you will stand before him. You'll stand before the holy God of heaven that requires a payment for sin. And your unrighteousness will always outweigh your righteousness. There is no scale. The scale is Christ's perfectness against your unrighteousness. And he will always outweigh it. So what do you got to do? Concern yourself with holiness. Understand that God died for you. Understand that you're a sinner and I need a savior. That one day I'm going to one day I'm gonna have to stand in front of God and give an answer for everything I've ever done. 